Uh, it's really good to be with you all today. Uh, good morning and welcome to our first Sunday, second Sunday of the season of Eastertide. Yesterday was the first Sunday of that. Um, I'm feeling a little tired and distracted, as I'm sure some of you are as well. It's why we have that time in, of intention at the beginning to hopefully reset some things. Uh, we had a broken screen this morning when we showed up. Uh, Kanan sounds like Johnny Cash, which I thought was delightful, actually. Um, I'm getting over a bit of a cold myself, and um, I think it's just been a lot. It's been a week, right, for a lot of people. I've been extremely preoccupied this last week, particularly with this one thing. Some of you know about it. Some of you have been involved in it. Tens of hours of my time and some of your time as well have been spent on writing this grant application. Normally when I'm raising money, I'm raising money either for our general operating budget or something specific like uh, ministry of our church, like the Inglewood Christmas Store. Uh, we still raise between fifty and $70,000 a year from outside of this congregation in order to have our church operate. Um, and we do that because we're uh, still a fairly small church, still a fairly new church, and we're in a pretty low income area. And so we need to raise some money from the outside in order to make that happen. Uh, the Inglewood Christmas Store raised tens of thousands of dollars every year to make that happen because we believe in it and we love it. And it's such a beautiful and incredible expression and outworking of the gospel in our community. But this last week, I've been focused on raising money for something that I never thought I would ask for money for. And that is for a sabbatical. So um, I was supposed to have a sabbatical this summer. If you're unfamiliar with what a sabbatical is, it is a, it is a, a leave of absence that a pastor will take in our employee handbook, it's every seven years, and we do that to recuperate, to do some time for study, some time for spiritual reflection and growth, and there's a lot of ways that a sabbatical can be used. It's not really a, like an extended vacation, it's a, really, a little more strategic than that, um, and it is meant to be tailored to the specific and unique challenges that a pastor faces. In your occupation, you face challenges that are unique to that occupation. I have challenges in my occupation that are unique to my occupation. A sabbatical is a way to respond to some of those things. Uh, because for a lot of different reasons, that was pushed till next summer, um, and I found out not too long ago that this grant application was due this coming Wednesday. Now, I don't know what I have planned next week, much less next year. So it is a tremendous uh, lift for me and for some of those of you who have surrounded me in this process to get this thing done. But from elders to Debbie, who is an incredible travel agent, uh, to my wife, who's given a tremendous amount of time to help us figure this out, it's coming together, which is really exciting. The reason why I'm bringing this up here in the homily section is because there's a question that's posed throughout this application several different times. It's actually um, it, on the kind of big PDF of the description of the whole thing. It's vertical along the side. And it's a question that I've found to be extremely meaningful. And I love that I'm being asked this question in preparation for a sabbatical. The question is, what will make your heart sing? What will make your heart sing? And it wasn't too long ago, honestly, where if somebody were to ask me a question like that, I would not have an answer. I wouldn't have any idea even where to begin. Now, in this particular case, I have too many answers, and that's been the problem, and my itinerary has been changed four to five times because I have a lot of ideas for how I could spend three months away, um, as I'm sure many of you would as well. But when Julie and I met, I was uh, 20 years old, 19, 20, something like that, a child, essentially. Um, and I, uh, I had no idea really what I loved in life or what I wanted in life. And Julie, in an effort to get to know me, asked me a lot of questions, things, simple questions, not really deep philosophical questions at the get-go, questions like, what is your favorite food? What is your favorite movie? What's your favorite place to be? Things like that. Very normal questions that you would ask somebody when you're developing an interest in them. And I, each one of these questions would send me into an existential crisis because I didn't know the answer to any of them. I didn't know what my favorite anything was. In fact, I thought that questions like that and the answers to them were sort of a waste of time. At that point in my life, I had taken life way too seriously. I had taken myself way too seriously. It was extremely self-important. I believed that everything needed to have some sort of pragmatic and utilitarian value. Otherwise, it was sort of a waste of time. Entertainment was silly to me. I didn't want to participate in any of it. And so along comes this person I'm extremely interested in and would like to get to know, and I would like for them to get to know me, and they're asking me these questions that feel like an attack. And all of a sudden, I have to figure out what these answers are. And in doing so, Julie injected a tremendous amount of joy into my life because now, years later, I'm able to answer questions like that. In fact, be very careful if you ask me a question about my favorite of something because you may receive a 40-minute monologue about that thing and all the other ancillary issues around it, um, whether it's movies or food or my favorite place 
Um, you may have to put up with me scrolling through my camera roll, and we're going to go past pictures of my kids, and I like them a lot, so I'm going to tell you about them. And it's kind of a give a mouse a cookie sort of situation if you ask me what my favorite thing is on anything. The, question, the answer to the question, what will make your heart sing, another way to a- a- ask that question and therefore answer it is to ask ourselves, what brings us delight? What sort of things in our life do we delight in? What brings us joy or extreme happiness or some sort of sustained and persistent delight? And in the season of Eastertide, we're going to take this time to focus in on the delight of God, the, the delight that we have in God, the delight that God has in us, his kids, the delight that we have in the world around us that God has created for us, the, our, our delight in the resurrection itself, the fact that, the, that death has lost its sting, our delight in the person and the character and the work of God. We're going to take our time to consider delight throughout the season of Eastertide. Now, this last... Um, this last week was Easter Sunday, and for many of you, you heard the word, the term Eastertide for the very first time, and it kind of caught your attention, and you were curious about it, and you wondered about it, and I thought I would take just a minute to fill you in a little bit on what that season is, because just like you, six years ago when we started this church, I was completely new to the concept and the idea. In my mind, for whatever reason, I whether it was taught to me or I came to believe it in some way, I thought that Jesus resurrected, like walked out of the tomb, and then like immediately ascended. It was just sort of all one thing. He just like resurrection ascension, just kind of straight into the sky, and there was really nothing in between there. But it turns out he spent about 40 days, as best as we can tell, doing some extraordinary things and doing a lot of really ordinary things like taking walks and eating meals and even fishing. He did a lot of really ordinary stuff during that time. This resurrected Jesus, who had conquered death, hangs out with his friends for 40 days. It's a pretty wild thing. And so we take an entire season to celebrate the resurrection because one day simply isn't enough. One day of celebrating the wildest and craziest and most amazing, incredible thing in our faith simply is not enough. And so we take a season to do so. Theologian N.T. Wright says this about it. If Lent is a time to give things up, Eastertide ought to be a time to take things up. Champagne for breakfast. Well, of course. So matter of fact, right? The 40 days of Easter season until the ascension ought to be a time to balance out Lent by taking something up, some new task or venture, something wholesome and fruitful and outgoing and self-giving. You may be able to do this only for six weeks, just as you were only able to go without beer or tobacco for only six weeks of Lent. But if you really make a start on it, it might give you a sniff of new possibilities. It's a very British way of going about saying um, that something amazing may happen. A new hopes, new ventures um, you never dreamed of. It might bring something of Easter into your innermost life. It might help you wake up to a, in a whole new way. And that's what Easter is all about. If you take the 40 days of Easter Eastertide uh, or the season of Easter and tack on the 10 days of Ascension Tide, which is when the church historically celebrates the Ascension, we just kind of jam those together and we say Easter Tide is a 50-day response to the 40 days of Lent. We had a time to lament and to, um, to sort of sit in the reality of sin and brokenness, and that was an important thing, not to rush through or to rush past, but now is a time to respond to that, and we respond to that in resurrection. If Lent is about suffering and crucifixion, Eastertide is about resurrection and celebration, and this is that season. So we're going to talk about resurrection a lot. And we're going to delight in it. We're going to experience that delight. And we're going to go through a process of delight and gaining delight and understanding delight in the book of Ephesians. Um, As we discussed this series and thought about what we wanted to approach and how we wanted to approach it uh, throughout the season, we thought it would be really great to go back to like a book study where we went chapter by chapter. Now, as you know, if you've been around for a little while, we will not go verse by verse. Somebody asked me recently why we call this time in our service a homily and not a sermon or a talk or a teaching. Um, It's because a homily is traditionally known as a short reflection on Scripture, a short reflection on Scripture. So I call it a homily to remind me that I'm not up here to exegete the entire text for you. We have growth groups for that. We have table groups for that. You have relationships, hopefully, that you can engage in that. You can do that on your own. I would love to do that with you if you ever want to get really deep and exegete into some Scripture. But our time here together today is to hear a reflection on a scriptural passage And we're going to do that throughout the book of Ephesians, throughout the season of Eastertide. And you're going to see why, very quickly, why we're in uh, 
uh, in, in the book of Ephesians throughout the season of Easter time. Our teaching text for today comes from chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians. This is from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. This is him corresponding with them. Okay, similar to our church here in Inglewood, there was a church in the city of Ephesus, and Paul wrote them a letter. We don't know if they initiated and wrote him a letter first. We don't know if this is his third, fourth, or fifth letter, but this is a letter that he wrote to the church in Ephesus, and it goes like this. Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Remembering you in my prayers, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you, he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for all of us who believe. This power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. When we explore some of the writings of the Apostle Paul, it can elicit several different responses. Some of you have read a lot of what Paul has written, or maybe you've sat through classes where Paul's writings have been expressed and exposed and sort of taken apart. If you're going to do any kind of exegetical Bible study or inducted Bible study, the letters of Paul are very popular for this kind of thing. It is unlikely that if you've been around the church for some length of time that you haven't really spent much time thinking about or reading from the Apostle Paul. He wrote like half of the New Testament. There's a tremendous amount of his fingerprints all over the Bible. Now, he's developed a reputation over time, a reputation for being somewhat harsh, somewhat confusing, fairly direct, for run-on sentences, the likes of which you have never seen. He focuses a lot on the sovereignty of God, a lot on the salvation that God offers. He's kind of a diehard evangelist for the salvation of God through Jesus Christ. But really, the thing that he's probably most known for, and this is particularly from his writings in the book of Romans, but just generally, is he is a systematic theologian. Okay, so a systematic theologian is one who helps you think about theology, think about who God is and what God does systematically. So taking you through a process from beginning to end. And the book of Romans in many ways is exactly that, a process of, uh, or a paradigm for how to think about who God is and what God does. But because he's developed such a reputation for that kind of thing, I find myself missing when he simply gushes with excitement and exuberance about the things that he loves most about God. And the book of Ephesians is very much that. We see this in Philippians and a couple of other books that he writes as well, where he just gets so excited about and enamored by something that he goes on and on about it. Despite pen and paper being difficult to come by at that time, he writes way too many words about these things that he absolutely loves. And we get to watch Paul delight in something that is beautiful. And my hope is that throughout this season, we will have the opportunity to join him in that delight to join him in the delight of the resurrection and all that it brings. There are three things I want to draw out of this particular text. There are questions after each item that I'd like for you to consider. The first is this. God clearly delights, or sorry, Paul clearly delights in God's church. He says this, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Somehow, the, the, um, the commitment of the Ephesian people, the commitment of the Ephesian Christians to both God and their neighbor has developed for them a reputation that has spread to wherever Paul is when he's writing this letter. It's not like somebody from like, the neighborhood tweeted, hey, the church in Ephesus really love God and really love their people, and therefore Paul heard about it immediately. It's very difficult at this time for word to travel. In the first century, the fact that they have a reputation, and he has heard this thing about them, he's heard this thing to be true, and it has um, caused him to write this letter is pretty tremendous. And his response to that 
is to delight in who they are and delight in all that God has done in them. And his delight in them is not just in the one time hearing of their love for God and their neighbor. His delight in them is persistent. He says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you since the day that I heard that you loved God and you loved your neighbor. His delight in them is persistent. And it leads me to ask the question to myself and to you, who are you delighted about? Or in whom do you delight? Like, who is it in your life that you have heard about? Maybe you don't know them, maybe you do. That you persistently and regularly take, bring to God in prayer to give thanks for. I think we live in a, a fairly disposable society. It's one of the reasons, that this is a small thing, but it's one of the reasons why we use real glasses um, for a communion because there's something durable about that and there's something persistent about that. It's one of the reasons why we practice rhythms of our faith, li faith like communion every single week because there is a durability to that. It's not disposable. It's not something you do once and then you throw away. But in the world around us, we're trying to always make things as disposable as possible. We're buying phones more frequently. Uh, I've, I've been told that the way that, we're, that uh, like the world is moving sort of with like electric vehicles, there could, a day could come where you would renew your vehicle much like you would a leased vehicle, and you would probably buy a new vehicle every couple of years because they're going to be made less and less expensively. They're going to be made, and made, made with less and less durability. A disposability is going to become more and more popular in the world around us. But what if our faith and our delight in other people was durable? Who are you delighted about? Second thing that he does here is he asks that the same delight that is his would be for them as well. He prays this. He says, I pray the eyes of your heart may be delighted in order that you, sorry, enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. So in addition to thanking God for these folks that he's heard about, he says, I'm also asking God that you would have blessing in your life, that you would have delight in your own life, and that the persistence in my prayers would actually result in a persistent blessing and a persistent delight in your life. Who are you asking God to bless? Who am I asking God to bless Sometimes our prayers, our time with the Father, whether it's in prayers of the people or our time on our own, gets very focused on ourselves and our own needs. Or we're only praying for people who are in a moment of crisis, but what about those who are experiencing delight? What if we prayed for more blessing and more delight on their life? I think that we gain delight and we gain joy and we gain hope and we gain peace when we pray for those things for other people. So who are you asking God to bless? Another thing that Paul does here, and I think that this is probably the most important thing um, that he does, at least in this section and maybe um, throughout the entirety of the letter, at least for this particular season, it is very clear that Paul is delighted in, enamored with, preoccupied by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Paul is filled with joy at the resurrection. And it makes me wonder for myself and for you, are we delighted in the resurrection? Are we delighted in the fact that death has lost its sting and grave its victory? Are we delighted in the truth of the resurrection? Are we delighted in the beauty and the implications of the resurrection? Now, some of you are having a little bit of a hard time with this because you're thinking, I'm not so sure what I think about the resurrection. Some of you aren't sure it's a historic event. Some of you aren't so sure you know exactly what it all means. And I want you to know that that is absolutely okay. In fact, I don't think that you need to have answers to all of those questions in order to delight in this story that we're going to keep telling for the next several weeks. We can find a tremendous amount of beauty and joy and delight in things that we don't fully understand. This last Wednesday, um, Jacob Collier came to the Gothic Theater to play a show. Um, uh, Kanan's dad got him tickets two years ago when he was supposed to come. He was going to come with Kanan. Erica was going to go. They were going to make a family thing out of it. Uh, it got postponed, obviously, to two years uh, later to this past week. Kanan's dad wasn't able to go. He, Kanan gave us his tickets. That's the long story short and how I got tickets. Okay, Never heard of this guy until Kanan told me about him a couple of years ago. Um, I didn't know what to expect. 
I don't listen to like a ton of music. I like some music, but um, from what I understand and what I'm gaining uh, understanding about is that Jacob is a, I'm gonna, we're first name basis, me and him. Um, uh, he's a musician for musicians, meaning musicians can appreciate and love what he does in a way that non-musicians probably can't. At least that's my assumption, okay? So we walk in and, and unsurprisingly, I, I recognize like, I don't know, five or six people in the room and they're all musicians. Every single person that I see there is a musician that I know. I'm with my wife, who's a musician, obviously. I'm with Kanan, obviously a musician. And my 15 year old daughter, who you've heard sing here a few times, also a musician. I'm probably the only person at the Gothic Theater that night, two back to back sold out shows that doesn't play a musical instrument at all, okay? So I wander in like an idiot and just kind of stand there as the show starts. And to, to say that it was a mind blowing experience is an understatement, okay? I know that people use that term and they mean a lot of things by it, but I'm not talking about like this was a delicious cheeseburger that had cheese and bacon on it. I mean, this was truly like it was incredible. Erica was ill and I'm just heaping on how good this show was, and I hate that for you, and I'm so sorry. Yes, good, they're, go, they're, they're going anyways, that's good. Um, I was moved to tears more than once. I felt as though I was a part of an experience that brought me so much incredible joy, despite the fact that I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea. I didn't know any of the instruments he was playing because they were all very weird. I didn't know how he was making the noises he was making. I didn't know how the band was doing what they were doing. None of it made any sense to me, and it did not matter for the delight that I experienced in that. Your ability to understand and explain and even make sense of something like the resurrection is not necessary for you to delight in it. Paul simply says, like, the power of the resurrection I mean, he doesn't explain what he means by that, but the power of the resurrection, there's not a lot of explanation for that. There's not a lot of sense to, to be made of that other than we know that the fact that somebody was dead, their heart had stopped beating, they had died from either asphyxiation or from blood loss or both in some way, and they were buried in the ground, and they, they were dead that entire time, and then one day they came back to life and walked themselves out of the tomb into new life. That happened, and that is worth celebrating doesn't matter if we understand it. We don't have to get to that right now. It's worth celebrating and finding a tremendous amount of delight in. My hope is that this, throughout this season and throughout this series, you're able to find extreme delight, not just in the people that you experience uh, who are a part of the body of Christ, the family of God, but also in God himself and his power and his ability to raise Jesus from the dead. That is a spectacular thing. Uh, for which we can experience a tremendous amount of joy day in and day out. And I hope that it brings you great delight. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for, for resurrecting your son, for bringing him back from the dead. Thank you for the hope and the implications and all the beautiful things that come along with it. But just simply today, we're just so grateful for the event itself. We can get to what it means for us some other time, but right now it happened and we're so glad that it happened. And I pray that, that, that our belief in it or our hearing of the story even would be enough to bring us delight, even if we can't explain the ins and outs of it. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On Sundays, uh, after we've had some times for some songs and prayers and teaching, I want to give you an opportunity to reflect for a couple of minutes. To just think about what you've heard. Maybe you jotted something down or maybe you need to jot something down. Uh, maybe there's a line from a song or a prayer that you'd like to remember um, and just think about and reflect on for a minute. So we're going to give you a chance to do that. Um, there's going to be some questions on this screen over here uh, that will help you reflect. It'll also give you a chance to lament some of the pain that you've experienced this last week or even celebrate some of the joy and the beauty. Maybe confess some of the things you've done wrong or some of the things you've left undone. So go through those questions when they're up on the screen. During this time is also a good time. We're going to take communion after this last, uh, this fourth song. Um, and so if you're a parent and you'd like for your kids to participate in communion, uh, you can go and get them uh, and bring them back. Once the song starts, Maggie and I will be up here with these communion elements. Uh, elders uh, Adam and Shelby will be in the back over there serving communion elements. So you can go in the back or the front, whatever you'd like, to grab your elements, take them back to your seat and hang on to them and we'll experience communion all together. So let's have a time for reflection. Lord, still our hearts, focus our minds.
draws here near to you.